Hey guys and welcome to British Guy Reacts. It is brilliant to have you with me again. Or indeed for your first time, if this is your first time, no judgement. I mean a little bit of judgement. Now today I'm going to react to one of the Crash Course videos. I've never done one of these before. It is about the War of 1812, which is a war which I think is much more remembered in America than in the UK. I know a little bit because I'm kind of history obsessed, but e even my knowledge is pretty, um, pretty skin deep. So I, I, I know it began in part because the British were oppressing, impressing, beg your pardon, American sailors. I know there was an American invasion of Canada, which was largely unsuccessful. And but the war ended with a battle at New Orleans, which happened after the war had actually finished, um, which was a, a huge British defeat. But and I, I also know that for a very long time, the war was kind of like a sideshow for the, for the British, because this was during the Napoleonic Wars, which was a, almost a fight for survival. It, it was a huge deal for the UK. Um, so this was a, very much a sort of a secondary conflict right until the very end. So, yeah, I, I hope that summary is um, doesn't make me look too stupid. And let's now watch the video. Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash Course US History, and today we're going to talk about what America's best mm, at. Excellent. War. <laughs> hey, he can say it. He's American. If I said uh, it, Mr. there'd be an Green, issue. The United States has actually only declared war five times in the last 230 years. Oh, me okay. past, you sniveling literal so that, that's well, officially. we're going to talk about America's first declared war, the mm. War of 1812. So oh, so this picture, I think I recognise it. I think that's the bombardment of... I can't remember its name. There was some thought that the British bombarded, um, and there was a poem was written about it, and it forms the basis of the US national anthem, which is used to this day. I can't remember what the thoughts are called, which is really bugging me, but hopefully we'll, we'll come to it later into the, later into the video. Called because historians are terrible at naming it. I mean, they could have called it the Revolutionary <laughs> it's, it's War. A, it's a literal name. Canadian it makes sense. Cataclysm or the war to facilitate future wars. <laughs> no, they just named it after the year it started. It's logical, it makes sense. I can understand. They should have for every war, make things much easier. So I haven't seen much of this channel, but I've heard good things. I know this disappoints the military historians among you, but as usual, we're going to spend more time talking about the causes and effects mm. of the war than the actual, like, killing parts, because ultimately... Okay, 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 well, in which case, this is a complete waste of time. I'm very sorry to have um, wasted a valuable minute and a half of your life. This, this was a disaster. Uh, if, there's, if we're not going to be covering the war... No, I, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I actually really like this way of doing it, because... Um, clearly the kind of the socio-economic reasons behind the war and implications are, if anything, more important than what actually happens, the, the, the kind of details of what happened in the war itself. So I, I'm actually a big fan of this approach, but I, I'm, I'm sure there'll be some stuff on the battles and stuff. The ambiguity of the War of 1812 that makes it so interesting. The reason mm. most often given for the War of 1812 was the British impressment of American sailors, whereby American sailors would be kidnapped and basically forced into British servitude. This disrupted right. American shipping. And also so this is um, a very interesting point. So I can completely understand why the Americans were furious about this. The the the, um, the kind of the counterpoint British argument, which for some reason I just have to make, is that. A lot of the sailors that were oppressed, or at least the British thought that a lot of the sailors they were impressing were British deserters. So at the time the British were fighting in the Napoleonic Wars, which was you know, one of, one of the, a, a huge um, you know, European-wide, even global conflict, and a lot lots of British sailors were deserting because it was quite frankly horrible being being a sailor on, on some of the ships. So the, the British were convinced that um, a lot of the British deserters were going to American ships, and that's why they they started, or part of the reason they started stopping and impressing men from American ships. Of course, in practice, I'm sure they also impressed um, American sailors, and I can totally understand why the US was furious about it. Also, seems like a reasonably obvious violation of American sovereignty. But yeah, it's a little more complicated I'll, I'll, I'll than give that. you that. First of all, there were many thousands of British sailors working aboard American ships, so many mm. of the sailors that the British captured were in fact British. Which gets to the larger point that citizenship at the time was a pretty slippery concept, especially mm. on the high seas. Like papers were often forged, and many sailors identified their supposed Americanness through tattoos, <laughs> and, like <laughs> eagles and flags. And it... That's that's fantastic. I, I think. I think we should get more broadly, we should just get rid of passports and everyone denotes their, their nationality by a, a tattoo representing their country on their chest. So the UK, well, the UK uses lions, but you don't get lions in the UK. So the UK can have like a robin or badger, uh, America can have eagles. It will just make customs and immigration more fun. 
There were several reasons why a British sailor might want to become or pretend to be an American, including mm. that the Brits at the time were fighting Napoleon in what historians, in their infinite creativity, called the Napoleonic Wars. <laughs> and on that topic, British impressment not... policy allowed them both to disrupt American shipping to France and to get new right. British sailors. So, so, so the British were trying to blockade France and its continental allies, so they were demanding that all shipping, all trade from America went through British ports first, which, which obviously the Americans hated, and I completely understand why they hated it. Um, but I mean, British naval superiority was a huge weapon in the Napoleonic Wars, and they were they were trying to use it ruthlessly to enforce an economic blockade. Sailors to strengthen their war effort, which was annoying to the Americans on a couple levels, especially the French-loving Republicans. Which yeah. is a phrase that you don't hear very often anymore. <laughs> yeah. Another reason often given for the war was America's crazy conspiratorial anglophobia. There was even a mm. widespread rumor that British agents were buying up Connecticut sheep in order to sabotage the textile industry, lest you worry that America. <laughs> okay, honestly, between between us, that one's true. We, that that we were doing that, and we're not, and we're not ashamed. But just keep that between us with conspiracy theories is new. So those pushing for war were known as war hawks, and the most okay. famous among them was Kentucky's Henry Clay. They took the impressment of sailors as an affront to American national honor, but they mm. also complained that Britain's actions were an affront to free trade, by which they meant America's ability to trade with Europeans other than Great Britain. Yeah. And to be fair, the British were trying to regulate American trade. They even passed the Orders in Council, which required American ships to dock in Britain and pay tax before trading so with I, other I can European totally nations. see why this got... We we're an independent nation. You can't do that kind of stuff. We have a special relationship. It's not that special. But the problem with saying this caused the war is that the orders had been in effect for five years before the war started, and they were rescinded in 1812. So in fact, that's, that's a really interesting point. So um, one of the causes of the war, which was the UK of uh, interfering with American trade, that actually stopped being in effect before the war began. And then one of the biggest battles of the war, the Battle of New Orleans, took place after the peace treaty was signed. So th th there was a, a clear issue of communication problems, um, both, both triggering the war and triggering its biggest battle, kind of unnecessarily, or, or partly unnecessarily anyway. Before the US declared war, although admittedly we didn't know about it because it didn't reach us until <laughs> yeah. after we declared war. There was no Twitter. Another mm, reason for the war was point. Canada. That's right, Canada. Americans it's wanted all Canada's to fault. blame them with your excellent health care <laughs> and your hockey and your first rate national anthem. Stan, yeah. this is fun, but enough with the hashtag 1812 problems. According to Virginia Congressman John Rudolph, agrarian cupidity, not maritime rights, urges the war. We have heard but one word Canada. Mm. Canada. Canada! <laughs> I'm not here to criticize you, John Randolph. That's actually three words. Now, some historians disagree with you. So, I mean, the, the Canada part is really interesting because during the Revolutionary War, as we looked at in, previous, in a previous video, there were attempts by the Americans to inspire um, a kind of rebellion in Canada from, um, from the Canadians who could then join the United States. That was pretty unsuccessful, and after the, the end of the Revolutionary War, a lot of British loyalists or, or Americans who had been loyal to the Crown went from the 13 colonies to Canada. And, and that, that massively strengthened Canada's attachment to the UK. So it, it, it's really interesting, the idea that, um, th that there were always Americans who wanted um, you know, parts of Canada, or Canada to be part of their nation and, and who thought that the Canadians should rebel against the British in the same way that they did. And it's really kind of interesting how these two different national identities were formed. With this, but the relentless pursuit of new land certainly fits in with the Jeffersonian model of an mm. agrarian republic. And there's another factor that manifests the American destiny. decision to go to war expansion into territory controlled by Native Americans. So, is that okay. a mystery document? So I'm, I'm not familiar with how this works. I haven't seen one of these before. I try to guess the author of the mystery document. Usually I'm wrong and I get shocked. <laughs> All right, let's see what we got here. You want, by your distinctions of Indian tribes and allotting to each a particular tract of land, to make them to war with each other. Yeah. You never see an Indian come and endeavor to make the white people do so. It's Tecumseh, drop the mic! Okay. It's something that I would do, except that the mic is actually attached to my shirt. <laughs> That's not an excuse. You can take it off and drop it. I'm not accepting that. John Green, I think your name is. Take your mic off. No drama in this. <laughs> Clearly a Native American criticism of white people, and I happen hmm. to know that that particular one comes from Tecumseh, and I don't get shocked today. So it shouldn't come as a surprise. Wait, so if he gets it wrong, he gets. Sh is that how this show, this show works? He gets tortured if he gets things wrong? Like, 
what, what, what's next? Fun screws if, if you get the, the, the documents location. I might watch more of this series just for the torture. And no, I'm not a crazy sadist. Surprised that Americans were continuing to push westward into territory where Indians were living. I mean, mm. this was a big reason for the Louisiana Purchase, after all. Right. By the beginning of the war, more than 400,000 settlers had moved into territories west of the original 13 colonies, and they outnumbered American Indians. It's interesting for the Americans, or, or some of the Americans, are so keen to expand into Canada, considering that they just bought uh, the Louisiana Purchase, which is far more than just Monday. Louisiana, which is one of the best deals in history. I mean, they got a huge amount of land for relatively little money because the French were desperate. But it's kind of interesting that they were still interested in expanding, even though that land hadn't been kind of fully secured um, and sort of occupied by this point. Indians by a significant margin. Some native groups responded with a measure of assimilation. Cherokees like John Ross wanted to become more civilized, mm. that is more white and Farmery, and some of them did even adopt such civilized practices as written languages and slavery. Yeah, civilized practice. I can, ah, I can see the issue. People here. are always like, "Why aren't you more celebratory of American history? Well, why isn't there more to celebrate?" <laughs> so, as as an outsider, um, I clearly there's a lot of bad stuff happening in American history, along well, a lot of good stuff. But as an outsider, I think there are very few countries that have done more to preserve and expand freedom and liberty than the United States. And I know that sounds really, really corny, but I also think it's true. And I know a lot, not a lot of Europeans will admit that, but I think deep down quite a lot of us know it. So yeah, America, you've got, you got a mixed history, but I think generally you come out on the, on the positive side. Indians wanted to resist. The best known of these were the aforementioned Tecumseh and his brother Tenska. Stan, can you just put on the screen? Yes, that's just oh wow, that. Tenska. Right. That's just for all you visual. Okay, I'm not. I'm so not going to give it all that. Because of his religious teachings and also because of the pronunciation <laughs> issues, so Prophet encouraged Indians, especially those living in and around the settlement of Prophetstown, to abandon the ways of the whites, primarily in the form of alcohol and manufactured consumer goods. <laughs> so stop drinking. I mean, that let's face that it still is the basis of Western civilization, isn't it? Alcohol and manufactured consumerism. So. You know, we haven't, we haven't changed much. Alcohol and eating refined sugars. This guy sounds like my doctor. He comes up with more military, <laughs> attempting to revive Neolwin's idea of pan-Indianism and actively resisting white settlement. As he put it, okay. sell a country. Why not sell the air, the great sea, as well as the earth? Did not the Great Spirit make them all for the use of his children? The Americans responded to this reasonable criticism in the traditional manner, with guns. Mm. William Henry Harrison destroyed the natives. So, th th I recognise that name, William, William Henry Harrison. I think, I'm not certain about this, I'm going to check it straight after. If, if I'm talking rubbish, please ignore me, I'm very sorry. I think he was president very, very briefly, like for, for a matter of days, and then got, got like the flu or a cold and, and became ill and died. Um, so that's the only reason I've heard of him before. I think he was like the shortest lasting president in American history. But that may be completely wrong. So I say, like, if, 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 you, if you've got like an exam tomorrow, please don't quote, quote me as a source on that. The settlement at Prophetstown in what would become known as the Battle of Tippecanoe. He would mm. later ride that fame all the way to the presidency in 1840. And then, spoiler alert, Ooh. he would give the longest inauguration address <laughs> ever catch a cold and die 40 days later. And I knew it! Yes! I knew it. I, okay, I'm, to be clear, I'm not celebrating the guy's death. That was very sad and tragic. I'm just amazed I've actually managed to remember something um, about American history, which isn't like the Revolution or the Civil War or anything after 1945. So yes, I'm giving myself a gold star, but not celebrating him dying. To American politicians, long speeches, fatal. So I just painted a pretty <laughs> negative picture of the Americans' treatment of the Indians, because it was awful, but I haven't mentioned how this relates to the War of 1812. Right, yeah, the well. Americans were receiving reports that the British were encouraging Tecumseh, which they okay. probably were. And the important thing to remember here... So that, that's interesting. So it sounds like there's almost like a proxy war going on between the British and Americans. Um, so in, in the same way that this isn't a politics channel, so I won't get into specifics, but in the same way that, say, certain Middle, East, Middle Eastern countries might be supporting certain militant groups to attack other Middle Eastern countries. Um, it, you know, even hundreds of years ago, it was still a very common way of kind of undermining your opponent by, um, by, by not, not by attacking them, but directly, but by kind of funding and arming their, their other enemies. That the War of 1812, like the Seven Years' War and the American Revolution, was also a war against Indians. Mm. And as in those other two wars, the Indians were the biggest losers. And not yeah, in the cool sad. way as the biggest loser, where, like, trainer Bob helps you lose weight, but in the really sad way. I got it. I don't get I think that's a reference I don't John get. I have to look so it the War of 1812 was the first time that the United States declared war on anybody. It was also the smallest margin of a declaration of war vote, 79 oh. to 49 in the House and 19 to 13 in the Senate. That the is now, 
relied on trade a lot, didn't want to go to war, while southern and western states, which were more agrarian and wanted expansion to get land for farming and slavery, did. The closeness of the vote reflects a profound ambivalence about the war. As Henry Adams wrote, Many nations have gone to war in pure gaiety of the heart, but perhaps the United States were the first to force themselves into a war they dreaded, in the hope that the war itself might create the spirit they laugh. <laughs> Don't worry, Henry Adams. In the future, we're going to get that's pretty gay and hardish about war. <laughs> anyway, as an actual war, the War of 1812 was something of a farce. Let's okay. go to the thought bubble. The U.S. Army numbered 10 to 12,000. So about 10 to 12,000 is a really small number for this time, and by European standards for this time period. I mean, the British would have had far more troops, but of course the British were also fighting in, in Europe, and that was by far their, their main focus um, when the Podomic Wars. So like, this, this was actually quite a good time if you wanted to have a pop at, at the British um, outside of Europe. This was a pretty good time to do it because they were so distracted with, with other conflicts. And, and its officers were sunk into either sloth, ignorance, or habits of intemperate drinking. The U.S. <laughs> Navy had 17 ships. Great Britain had a thousand. Mm, yeah. also, I, 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 I don't fancy those money, odds. Britain collected 40 times more tax revenue than the U.S. But Britain was busy fighting Napoleon, which is why they didn't really start kicking America's butt until 1814, after Napoleon was defeated. Guess we'll find Napoleon's out. defeat was also the end of the practice of impressment, since Britain didn't need so many sailors anymore. Initially, much of the war consisted of America's attempts to take Canada, which any map will show you went smashingly. <laughs> Americans were confident that the Canadians would rush to join the U.S. When marching from Detroit, General William Hull informed the Canadians that, quote, you will be emancipated from tyranny and oppression and restored to the dignified station of free men. Mm. So it's, it's, it's very, um, it's curious how the War of 1812 kind of affected Canadian and American national identity. So before the war, um, I mean, obviously a, a lot of, American loyalists moved to Canada, so that there was a kind of groundswell of support. But I think there were probably still a lot of people who were a bit ambivalent, and, and especially obviously you had French Canadians. I mean, you still do have French Canadians. And during the Napoleonic War, I, I don't know what their position was, but you kind of imagine they might have been more sympathetic to, to the French. So it's kind of interesting how, um, I mean, you can totally understand why the Americans thought that they, they were the people, there would be some people in Canada who would welcome them. Um, and it's kind of interesting how like their kind of Canadian identity as being separate from Americans got really strengthened, strengthened by the conflict. And the Canadians were like, yeah, we're okay, actually. <laughs> and so the British in Canada, with their Indian allies, went ahead and captured Detroit and then the right. surrender. America's lack of... I, I, I never heard about the capture of Detroit. That's um, completely news to me. Um, that's, I mean, I, I, in no way can that be attributed to the city's current decline. Well, I've, I've heard it's actually doing quite well now, so I'll take that back. Anyway, I'm rabbiting on. Canada was primarily attributable to terrible strategy. They mm. might have succeeded if they'd taken Montreal, but they didn't want to march through northern New York because it was full of Federalists who were opposed to the war. Instead, oh. they concentrated on the... So I'm not sure if they were worried that the Federalists would, like, inform and tell the British what was happening or kind of spy for them, or whether it was just... Because in those days, an army marching through land was a pretty horrible experience. Um, whether it's just they didn't want to further antagonize the already anti-war Federalists. West, that is the area around Detroit, where fighting went back and forth. The British found much more success, even seizing Washington, D.C. and burning the White House. Mm. In the course of the battle, British Admiral George Cockburn, overseeing the destruction of a newspaper printing <laughs> That's house, quite told name. the forces that took the city, be sure that all the seas are destroyed so that the rascals cannot any longer abuse my name. <laughs> it's hard out there. Honestly, if, if I was called Cockburn, I would also wage an all-out war on the English language. I mean, the, the burning of the White House and... Because there's it, it also other, other buildings like the Capitol were burned. Um, basically, all the big government buildings were burned. I mean, the British said it was in retaliation for the burning of... Um, uh, uh, there was an Amer the Americans captured a big Canadian city, or well, a Canadian city, and burnt most of its government buildings. The, the British claimed it was retaliation for that. I don't know if that's true. Obviously, that's how the, um, like the the White House then became painted white to cover up the damage, and also because it does look really, really cool. So, I, I've heard that there was the, the British suffered more losses in a storm following the the attack on Washington D.C. than they actually did in the battle for D.C. itself. Uh, which, which which shows you something about kind of the intensity of the warfare at the time. 
there for a cockburn. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Given these problems, it's amazing there were any American successes, but there yeah. were. The battleship USS Constitution broke the myth of British naval invincibility when cannonballs bounced off it and earned it the nickname Old Ironsides. Oh, Old wow. Hazard Perry defeated a British fleet in, of all places, Lake Erie. At the Battle <laughs> of the Thames, William Henry Harrison defeated Tecumseh, and the Battle of Horseshoe Bend showed one of the reasons why Indians were defeated when Andrew Jackson played one group of Creeks against another group of Creeks and Cherokees. 800 Indians were killed in that battle. And speaking Aye, of Jackson, wow. the most notable American victory of the war was the Battle of New Orleans, which catapulted him to prominence. He lost Aye. only 71 men while inflicting 2,036 British casualties. Of course, that's, cra that's crazy numbers. O only 71 men lost. Well, what were the British doing? Were the British, like, advanced without weapons? They decided to have a punch-up and like, fight with it. That, that, that's, that, that's insane. I definitely want to watch something about the, the, um, the Battle of New Orleans, because clearly it was a bit of a turkey shoot. <laughs> Of course, the most memorable thing about the battle was that it took place two weeks after the peace treaty ending the yeah. war had been signed, but hey, that's not Jackson's fault. Again, no Twitter, hashtag 1815 problems. The Treaty of Ghent, which ended the war, proved just how necessary the war had been. Not at all. No territory changed hands. When okay. negotiations started in August 1814, the British asked for northern Maine, demilitarization of the Great Lakes, and some territory to create an independent nation for the Indians. And well, that's, that's fascinating. So it, like, I, I love alternative history. Um, and you kind of wonder, like, maybe if the British had done a little bit better, or if the British had been a bit more committed to the war, would they have got that? those demands in particular where they've got the the independent indian nation um and, and could that still exist today and you know, like how would history or, or or would the independent indian nation i guess just be like a british puppet state and not really independent at all it's a really interesting question um whether you could have an independent native american state so i, I, I said i didn't mean native american state um around the time of the war of 1812 northwest but none of that happened, not because the U.S. was in a particularly good negotiating position, but because it would have been awkward for Great Britain to carve out pieces of the U.S. and then tell Russia and Prussia <laughs> that they couldn't take pieces of Europe for themselves to celebrate their victory uh, okay. in the Napoleonic so, so by the sound of things, it, it wasn't that far from there being an independent Native American nation, which would have been fascinating and, and would have sort of turned history. Um, I mean, it, it, even if it had possibly just been a British puppet state. Would have, would have, you know, completely changed the history of North America. So that, yeah, that's, that's something I didn't know about. It's really interesting. Provisions in the treaty about impressment or free trade, and basically the treaty returned everything to the status quo. So okay. neither the U.S. nor Britain actually won. But the Indians, <laughs> who suffered significant casualties and gave up even more territory, definitely lost. Uh, so with a treaty sad. like that, the war must have had a negligible impact on American history, right? Except no. The War of 1812 confirmed that the U.S. would exist. Britain would okay. never invade America again until 1961. I mean, the U.S. would discuss... <laughs> I like to think of this channel as the fourth British invasion. So you've got the Revolutionary War, uh, War of 1812, the Beatles, and then British Guy Reacts. That's the kind of the, the four big American invasions that will be in history. I, I am sure about that. The in Great Britain was happy to let them trade as long as that trade wasn't helping a French dictator. The war right. launched Andrew Jackson's career and solidified the settlement and conquest of land east of the Mississippi River, and our okay. lack of success in Canada reinforced Canadian nationalism while also ensuring that instead of becoming one great nation, we would forever be Canada's pants. The war also... <laughs> yeah, I'd love to know more about um, how Canadian identity was formed, because at, at what point did Canadians go from thinking of themselves as kind of British subjects in North America to thinking of themselves as Canadians, as a, as a disparate people themselves. There, there must be some videos on Canadian history I can watch, but that, that's a, a really interesting subject. And how much did the War of 1812 kind of play such a role in ensuring they didn't define themselves as Americans, that they, they were very much not American. Um, and so then when they decide they're not British, they're, they're Canadian rather than anything else. Spelled the end of the Federalist Party, which tried mm. in 1815 with the Hartford Convention to change the Constitution. In okay. retrospect, the Hartford Convention proposals actually look pretty reasonable. They wanted to eliminate the clause wherein black people were counted as three fifths of a human yeah, and required that, that, that a seems sensible. congressional majority to declare war. But because they had their convention right before Jackson's victory at New Orleans, they only came off looking unpatriotic and out of touch, as mm. the elite so often do. It's hard to argue that Americans really won the War of 1820. But we felt like we won, and nothing <laughs> unleashes national pride like war winning. The nationalistic fervor that emerged in the early 19th century was, like most things, good news for some and bad news for others. But right. what's important
important to remember, regardless of whether you're an American, is that after 1812, the United States saw itself not just as an independent nation, but as a big player on the world stage. For better and for worse, that's a gig we've held on to. And no matter how you feel about America's international interventions, you need to remember it didn't begin in Afghanistan or even Europe. It started with freaking Canada. <laughs> Thanks for watching. See you next week. So that, that was very interesting. Um, I, I learned a lot. I, I still feel like I've got a lot more to learn about this time period, so I'm definitely going to look out some more videos. Um, dig the Battle of New Orleans, because I want to know how, like, why was it so one-sided? Did, did, did the British just like, lose all their powder or something? Um, or, or, or turn up with snowballs? So I want to I find out more about that. But yeah, no, that, that was a really interesting video. Um, I think this is a great channel, so I'm definitely going to watch more of it. I, I'm very grateful for, for you spending the time to watch it with me. Um, as always, you know, please do subscribe. All that good stuff. And I hope to see you again. Thanks.